12. Last week we moved into another section of Paul's letter to the church at Corinth. where he's now addressing the matter of the, of the charismata, the spiritual gifts. I told you last week that like many other things in this letter, there's been, a question has been posed to him that he's answering. There's been apparently some abuse of these things in the congregation, just like there was an abuse of uh, their appreciation to God for the pastoral leadership he had given them, uh, people picking sides, uh, choosing a preacher they preferred and putting down the preacher they didn't prefer. Paul said, that's nonsense. They had, uh, they had winked their eye at immorality in the congregation. They were taking one another to court, misunderstanding marriage, not responding biblically to the privilege of liberty, abusing the Lord's Supper, and now this latest matter. We last week read this passage and, and basically gave you sort of some preliminary thoughts or introductory thoughts on the topic. Today we want to look at these verses 1 through 11, 1 Corinthians 12, 1 through 11. I hope you found that in your Bible. If you don't have a Bible with you, we put it on the screen for you. If you would stand with me and follow along as I read the Apostle Paul's concern. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are varieties of service, but the same Lord. There are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in every one. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom. To another, the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the ability to distinguish between spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. And to another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit, who apportions to each one individually as he wills. We've read together what? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. May the Lord teach us, as we said last week, the value of the spiritual gifts. Two, two ditches to stay out of, folks. One, obviously, is the abuse of these things. That's happening all around. But just as dangerous is the neglect of these things. My prayer is that as we go through chapters 12, 13, and 14, that there will be stirred anew and afresh in each of us, individually, as a congregation as a whole, the, the uh, desire and the uh, engaging with the spiritual gifts God has given us to make this church all that it should be. Thank you. Please be seated. We told you last week that the, that the bulletin graphic uh, is going to be on here for a few weeks as we go through this study. And I pointed out to you that as you look at the four different places where we're gifts are mentioned. There's no two lists that are the same. Also, this particular, the way this list is, is formed, uh, after the one in Romans 12 that we read together a while ago, uh, then this particular list puts in italics the gift that's already been mentioned previously. So you look at 1 Corinthians 12 and you see some italicized words there. Ephesians 4, more italicized words. 1 Peter 4, 
more italicized words. These occur. And so I, I gave this and I said, I want you to look at this, think about this, and ask yourself some questions. Why are the, why are the lists different? But what should we make of those gifts that recur? Think about that. We told you last week there are two, uh, two Greek words that Paul plays off of in our Corinthian material here. One is the word pneumatica. Uh, if you know about pneumonia, uh, you see the word up there. If you have pneumonia, you have a, you have a disease of the lungs or the, a disease in breathing from the pneuma, breath or spirit. Uh, it speaks of specific demonstrations of the ministry of the Holy Spirit in 1 Corinthians 12, 1. And then the, uh, and you see that verse there, we're going to look at that in a moment. Then the charismata. The charismata is a uh, specific manifestations of charis, that's the word for grace. The, the grace gifts, or the graces, if you please. It, when, you're, when you're shown in salvation, you're saved by grace through faith. At that point in the, in the new birth, there is implanted within you the graces that the Lord intends to cultivate in you and use as he grows you to be a blessing to the body. And you see that uh, in 1 Corinthians 12, 4. We're going to look at both these verses there. I just want you to, to see, and, and I highlighted in both of these examples here uh, where those words occur. We also told you last week that there were, there were three certainties that wherever a person lands on, on the gifts, and we're going to try to work all that out as we move through this, there are three certainties that cannot be denied from this passage and companion passages. And this comes from J.I. Packer in his, his book, God's Words. He says, first of all, a spiritual gift is in a, and by the way, we have these printed in your bulletin for you if you want to take that home and, and hang on to that there in an insert there. Spiritual gift is an ability to express, celebrate, display, and so communicate Christ in a way that builds up and strengthens the faith of other Christians and enlarges the church. Second, spiritual gifts may be broadly classified as either abilities of speech or of loving, practical helpfulness. Paul's list of, of gifts alternates in chapter 12, verses 6 to 8 in Romans between the categories, prophecy, teaching, and exhorting are gifts of speech. Serving, giving, leading, and showing mercy are gifts of helpfulness. However much they differ as forms of human activity, all are of equal dignity when one properly uses the gift one has. 1 Peter 4, 10 and 11 says that. Third, no Christian is without some gift of ministry. I told you last week, you meet a Christian that says, well, I don't have any spiritual gifts. Then, then one of two things, either they're not a Christian or they've, just not, they've not been taught to, to consider the implications of the grace that's shown to them in salvation. And then when you, when you think about this section in chapter 12 versus chapter 14, you realize that the, Holy, that, that the New Testament gives prominence to the Holy Spirit. He is a person. I told you that when we say the Holy Spirit, it, we need to stop, say, wait a minute, that's wrong. Pointed out to you last week. If you show me pictures, Joe and Vicky have a, have another brand new, brand new grandbaby. How many is this? Fifteen. Okay, only fifteen grandchildren. Uh, and uh, and if, if if Vicky pulled out that picture, said, "Look at this grandchild," and I would say, "Well, uh, isn't it darling?" She would not be happy, and she shouldn't be happy. I don't care how much confusion <laughs> there is in our culture today. There's clarity in God's creation, in creatures made in His image, and in the Godhead. The Holy Spirit is a person. References to Him are found in every book of the New Testament except Philemon and 2nd and 3rd John. In all the writings of the New Testament, however, none is so full of teaching about the Spirit as are the letters of Paul. The Spirit is mentioned nearly 120 times in Paul's letters. He wrote half the New Testament. The Holy Spirit was not primarily a doctrine, though there is the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. He was not primarily a doctrine to the New Testament uh, Christians. He was 
an experience, a person to experience. If you handed me a resume of a young lady you were thinking about courting, but you didn't know anything about her, didn't have anything experience with her, again, that's not impressive. The prophets predicted what we know as the day of Pentecost, Joel 2, 28. In that day, I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and, and the young men and the, will, will do things. The old men, this was the promise of Joel, the prophet. There was abuse in Corinth. One, one fellow described it this way. Some persons who were deluded or impostors claimed to be instruments of the Spirit. Some envied those, in their opinion, uh, who possessed superior gifts. Others, puffed up with pride, made an ostentatious display of their gifts. There are also indications that at least on occasion, several persons clamored to exercise their gifts at the same time. Confusion and cacophony rather than order and harmony, which is a mark of God's presence. Others focused their attention on the more spectacular or what we would call remarkable gifts, specifically speaking in, in other languages, and depreciated the gifts that Paul considered more useful, those things that move the body, that minister to the body. The result was envy, vanity, and division. So it's to correct this that Paul writes chapters 12, 13, and 14. Just give you a real quick summary. Chapter 12 contains a general survey of spiritual gifts, emphasizing their common origin. I told you last week, there's varieties, but one spirit. There's this from the one spirit, one spirit. Their remarkable diversity and their one great purpose. Chapter 13, the love chapter, as it's called, sets forth the practice of love as the most excellent way. One writer said, there's a good way, 1 Corinthians 12, and 14, there's the better way, the best way, 1 Corinthians 13. In chapter 14, verses 1 to 25, Paul deals specifically with the gift of tongues, contrasting it with the gift of prophecy and showing the superiority of the latter. And then the passage in chapter 14 closes with general directions concerning how this looks and should look in worship. So, today... We want to look at verses 1 through 11. And it falls out into three parts for us today. There's the test of speaking in the Spirit, verses 1 to 3. The diversity of spiritual gifts, verses 4 to 11. And that's hopefully where we'll get today. And then the last portion of this we'll take up next week, Lord willing. The test in verses 1 to 3. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. About spiritual gifts. He introduces this topic. Don't want you to be ignorant, being mistaken, as they were about many other things, as they could very well be coming out of pagan backgrounds where there was, uh, in the cult of Dionysius, there was uh, ecstatic, uh, exotic conduct. You remember the prophets of Baal when Elijah went up against them and how, how worked up they got. And Elijah taunt, taunted them. They were all bound up in this, uh, this frenetic activity. Paul wants the Corinthians to know that the God who is the God of order is the God where these gifts originate. He says, you were, you were led astray. Why would he say that? Unless they're being influenced in their uh, application 
of what they understand to be the charismata in their worship. Remember, these folks came out of temple cult worship in Corinth. And if you bring that into the New Testament church, uh, there can be real problems. You have to filter and discern what comes from God. What would God have us to do? What does divine worship look like? So the crucial test, Paul puts here, for deciding whether those who claim to be under the influence of the Spirit were really so is verse 3. Therefore, in the light of where you've come from, having been under the influence and the sway of evil spirits, I want you to know I want to make known to you. I don't want you to assume or conclude or to bring in with you something that should not be a part of the life of the body of Christ. The test has to do with loyalty to Christ. No one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus is cursed. You would never... It would never cross our minds, surely, to say that or say that Jesus is a curse or that Jesus, I'm, I'm cursed because I know Jesus. You wouldn't do that. But folks, there's a ripple effect from this. We need to be careful. We, when, when we are in Christ, we do not trivialize Jesus. First of all, because of his person. But secondly, because the spirit dwelling in us, if, if you were to, uh, and this, we're in such a defiled culture today. People say the most awful things. Even people who claim to be friends <laughs> of Jesus, you see some of the most awful things said that trivializes him. I remember seeing a sign, year, it's been decades ago now. God is like Hallmark. Because he cared enough to send the very best. That's just a trivializing of, the, of, the, of our God. So we've got to be careful here. And when you, if, you've, if you've grown up in a climate that, that talks cheesy and, and silly about Jesus, you know, you've got you to shed that. But you need to understand this. When that happens, the Holy Spirit is grieved. Jesus said of the Holy Spirit, when he comes, he will not speak of his own. He's not going to call attention to himself. And that's one of the marks, by the way, in the whole spiritual gift discussion. He will testify of me. He will glorify me. He will point to me. The charismata promote in the life of a believer to make much of Jesus. And then he says that you can't say Jesus is Lord. We can teach a parrot. Nettie, your parrot could probably learn to do that. All right? But that's not what he's talking about here. He's saying that there is no sincere expression of the Lordship of Jesus except that it is birthed by the Holy Spirit. So anybody can mouth it. But one of the hallmarks of a person who's been born again is that Jesus is my Lord. His way, His word, His will, His agenda, His name, His gospel, His glory should beat uppermost in our lives. And when that's not happening, the Spirit is grieved. When the Spirit is grieved, by the way, we're not studying that right now, that's, that's in another letter. When the Spirit is grieved, he doesn't go hide in the corner like a sad child. When the sovereign Spirit of God is grieved, he will begin to trouble you. He'll trouble you. Because he makes much of Jesus. At the outset here, one of the indicators of a healthy expression and experience of the charismata is the intelligible utterance of the lordship of jesus christ and that's a mark for paul it's a marker tell us where he's going 
uh, one of the commentators, Barrett, said, not the, not the manner, but the content of ecstatic speech determines its authenticity. Where is it coming from? And so Paul opens the discussion with this, with this challenge that apparently the, it was the whole idea of speaking in the Spirit. What does speaking in the Spirit look like, Paul? Because here's what's happening in our church at Corinth. We need to have a mindset, engage our mind in all that we do. If you, if you ever read anybody who says to, to surrender your mind in the name of sanctification, close the book, walk away. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Stop being conformed to the world standard, but keep on being transformed by the renewing of the mind. The mind is never unengaged in the in the expression and application and pursuit of the gospel okay so there's this test we superimpose it on ourselves is this making much of Jesus if I'm making much of me that's sin if I'm making much of Jesus that's glorious the second thing is the diversity of gifts it says, now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit, verses 4 to 11. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. Watch this. Verse 4, Spirit. Verse 5, Lord. Verse 6, God. He is speaking in Trinity here. He is invoking the power of the tr Trinitarian, the triune God. Spirit, Son, who's the Lord, Father. It says there are varieties of activities, but it's the same God who empowers them all and everyone. So you have here the word gifts, the word service, the word activities. Speaking, and, and the way you see this is this beautiful diamond of the charismata, and you turn it, and you see these brilliant facets it's all the same reality. Look at verse 7. Why, do we, why are we given spiritual gifts? Is it to make me feel good? Well, I know I'm saved because... No, there are, there are ways to gain assurance. 1 John is written so that you might know that you have eternal life, chapter 5, verse 13. And the whole book... Chapter 1, verse 1 through chapter 5, verse 12 was written. This little letter was written that you may know that you have eternal life. This text says that the manifestation of the Spirit was given for the common good. How am I using spiritual giftedness to bless the body? If I'm off like, like a lone ranger, I don't care what spiritual gifts a person thinks he has or she has. If you're operating on your own, without regard for this body that God's placed you into, that's an abuse of the charismata. Then he goes on and says, for to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom. To another, the utterance of knowledge, according to the same Spirit. Get this, this feel of this here. To another, faith by the same Spirit. We'll talk about these things in a little more extended, but not, not saving faith here. Some, it's not that some are given saving faith and some are not. All who are saved have been given saving faith. This is, this is the expression of faith. Have you ever read the life of George Mueller? Have you ever read that? Oh, my if you haven't, you need to. You need to read the biography, autobiography of George Mueller. Faith. To another, gifts of healing by the one spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the ability to distinguish between spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. 
to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. How do you get the gifts that you have when you are saved? By the sovereign pleasure of the Spirit. You see that? Who apportions to each one individually as he wills. So when just reading that, I hope you, I hope you get the sense of diversity in the body. Paul will argue later, if, if, if the whole body were an eye, that'd be weird. I showed Karen a picture I saw the other day. It's a big tree somewhere, and somebody had gotten a couple of big beach balls and had bleached them white and had painted black eyeballs on them and stuck them in a tree. I would not want to live next to that fellow. Walk out every morning and see these two eyes peering at you from a tree. The whole body were an eye, it would be, if it was a tongue. You see the point, it's a body, and Paul's going to get into this whole body discussion with us. It's about diversity. Let's look at this real quick. We're going to have to wrap this up and get back after it next week, God willing. Verse 7, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good, serves three purposes here. First, it asserts that to every believer a manifestation of the Spirit is given. Every believer. That's why we said, if, if you're saved, it's, it's, it's wrong to say, well, I don't have any spiritual gifts. That's a devil's lie. He's lying to you. The devil hopes you don't discover the spiritual gifts God has given to you. Because if you do, then you become a formidable force for the glory of God and the advance of the gospel in and through the local body where the Lord has placed you. He wants the, Folks, if you don't know it yet, the devil wants to put you on ice. The devil wants you to be like clothes washed and left in the washing machine. You know anything about that? Forget about them for a while. Then remember when you can't find your favorite piece of clothing and go get them. And you open the door to the washing machine. I don't care how fresh the stuff was you washed them with. It's, oh my goodness. That's what the devil wants you to become. He and his minions fear that a congregation of people will discover individually and collectively the spiritual gifts God has given because he knows that, that God's power flows through that. So it's three purposes. Every believer has a manifestation. So the gifts are not the special privilege of a few outstanding persons. <laughs> Each one. And it's from the Spirit. It's not a manifestation of what you know. Well, I, I think I've studied more than, no, it's not, it's not a manifestation of, of how much you've studied. Your serious engagement of the Word will cultivate your understanding and awareness of the charismata there, but you don't get them by how bright you are. You don't get them by how much you give. And it's a mark of the Spirit's presence within us. One commentator said these, these gifts blossoming out in rich, changeful variety disclose the potencies of the Spirit ever dwelling in the church. It's an evidence, that's one translation, it says rather manifestation, evidence. Secondly, by affirming that each believer's gift is a manifestation of the Spirit, the verse tacitly rebukes those Corinthians who were attaching a special importance to the particular gifts they possessed. The question here should be asked, it's asked in the script, what do you have that you have not received? And if you received it, then why do you boast as if it's yours? We're stewards. 
We're stewards. Third, the verse affirms that just as these diverse gifts have a single source, so also they have the same purpose. All intended, as I said, for the common good. It's a view to mutual benefit. There is no hoarding or harboring or clinging tenaciously to the charismata, the gifts given to you when the Lord saved you. Now look, if you're sitting there going, Preacher, I don't think I know what my spiritual gifts are. I must not be saved. Don't let the devil bring you to that conclusion. Rather, if that's how you're feeling right now, then say, Lord, I'm not sure I know, but I want to know. Uh, just as surely as I, as I want to know Jesus Christ because you saved me by his blood and righteousness, I, I want to know. I want to know. When, when the Spirit came and gave me the new birth and enabled me to repent of my sin and trust in Jesus Christ and saw him altogether lovely and, and wonderful, I want to know what you planted in me. And if you say, well, well, preacher, I think I know. All right, that's wonderful. Is that fresh? Is it fresh or stale? Ah, no. That, that sounds stale to me. Fresh or stale? Gifts of God who graciously saves, gives new life, new purpose, and plants within us. Peter says we've been made partakers of the divine nature. We have not, as some people teach, been made divine. Partakers of the divine nature. We have been given grace gifts that enable us individually, but especially collectively to be a powerful force for good. So we close with this today. We're going to pick this up next week. That's okay. If Jesus comes between now and then, We'll have us a sure enough teacher in heaven. We're going to know it all. It's going to be wonderful, okay? So hang on. How am I using the spiritual gifts God gave me when he saved me to be a blessing to this body of believers? That's a serious question. No man is an island. No one stands alone. We're going to look at the whole body language discussion, the, the language of body. We're coming up on that. So I want to send you out today. Have you been saved? Because if you've been saved, you've been gifted. Do you know? Are you can't, somewhat aware of the spiritual gifts God's given you? Don't cop out. Say, well, I, I don't think I have any. That's not an option. Not for a Christian. And are you intentionally using these to bless not some, not some little, oh, this, this is my little niche over here. No, there are no niches in the body of Christ. To bless the body. To bless the body. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, we come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and we read this and we confess, Lord, there's, we're going to struggle with some, some mystery in, in the language, wanting to make sure we make right application. But folks, there, Lord, there's some things here that are just plain as day. All here who are saved have been gifted. And the same Spirit is the one who has done that. And the sovereign Spirit is the one who has determined that. So help us, Lord, to discover, embrace, cultivate, use the spiritual gifts that you gave us when you saved us by your grace and for your glory. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together and sing as we prepare.